Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Libraries That Learn, Analysis of LibQual Comments to Drive Service Improvement at McGill University. This webinar is being recorded on Tuesday, May 5, 2015. All phone lines have been muted to cut down on background noise. You may ask a question at any time using the chat link in the upper left corner of your screen. I would now like to turn the floor over to Martha Kirilidou of the Association of Research Libraries. Martha, please go ahead. Thank you, Amy. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the third in a series of uh, webcasts uh, we've been uh, recording um, in the Libraries at Learn series. And uh, they have focused uh, uh, on the use of LibQual data. Uh, the ones that uh, uh, you see on gray on your slide, they have already been uh, recorded and are available on the ARL YouTube channel. And uh, we have uh, the one today and another one coming up on September 22nd. Uh, so I hope uh, many of you will be able to join us at that time too. Um, without Further ado, I'm really very pleased to have uh, here with us today Lori Cloda, assessment librarian at McGill University. Lori has uh, is, an, is a well-known researcher. She's um, one of the editors of the Evidence-Based Library and Information Science Journal, and she's been working with live call data um, with a, a rich array of live call data at McGill, as we will see. Lori, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martha, um, and thank you, everyone. Um, it's nice to be able to speak to you today. Uh, so as Martha explained, I'm going to be um, talking, focusing um, today's presentation on how at McGill we have uh, dealt with analyzing the comments, the open-ended comments portion of LibQual results in order to drive service improvement. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to try to cover in the next um, 15 to 20 minutes um, before we open up to questions, I'll give you a little bit of background about LibQual at McGill and um, what, we've, what, what we have had um, been able to do um, over the years and talk a little bit about um, not so much a problem, but the issue we have with all of the, the data we have, the qualitative data, and how um, we decided to solve that issue. Um, and then I'll go into more details about um, the goals and process of how we now analyze comments um, in LibQual um, and the results and recommendations that came out of the last time that we did that process. And finally, I'll give a bit of an overview of the toolkit we developed here at McGill Library for going forward with analyzing uh, LibQual comments. So just a little bit of background um, for those of you who might not know. McGill University is located in Montreal in Quebec, Canada. It's an English language university in a French-speaking prov province. Um, we have a very diverse student population um, from all over the world, um, and we are a government-funded um, institution. Uh, we have over 37,000 full-time students. About 8,000 of those, almost 9,000 of those are graduate students. We have over 3,000 instructional faculty, and about half of those are tenure stream. And uh, in a given year, we, we have about uh, less than 800 doctor's degrees that are awarded. Um, for about 10 years running now, McGill University has been ranked first in Canada among the medical doctoral universities. Um, and that's a nice sunny photo of McGill. Um, and now I have a photo of the winter. Um, and so last year, McGill ranked 30th uh, in ARL. It's composed right now of 10 branch libraries. Um, most of those are in the downtown campus. We have one library on our um, satellite campus in um, the suburbs. The annual budget of the library is equivalent to 32, American dollar, 32 million American dollars. And our collection, um, print and electronic, is just over 6 million volumes. So, um, historically, McGill has um, a long and fruitful relationship with LibQual. This year um, was the tenth iteration of the LibQual survey. And so as you can see, um, since its beginning, um, McGill has been using the survey to inform service improvements. Um, and uh, as a result, we have a lot of historical data and we have a lot of experience um, getting the LibQual uh, reports and results and trying to use them to make changes. And we've been pretty successful at doing so. Um, but just to let you know, um, 
my role as assessment librarian only began in September of 2012. And so what that means is that though I've been at McGill for a while, um, we, we had somebody else working with the survey up until that point. Um, and so I came in and the 2012 survey had already been run. Um, and so what I'll talk about is a little bit about how um, I, my role in coming in and how I decided to, um, going forward, deal with the comments part, the qualitative data part of the results of the LibPol survey, um, and what we did for the 2013 implementation of the survey. We just closed, or actually we're just closing today, the 2015 um, survey. So this is um, a general sort of overview, the typical sampling um, method that we use. So we don't, uh, we run the survey quite frequently. We don't um, send it out to all of our students. We send it out to a sample of undergraduate and graduate students, and we send it to all tenure stream faculty. Um, and on a given year, um, for each of these groups, we get a response rate of about 10 to 13 percent. So what this means is that um, we send out the survey to about 10,000 members of the McGill community. The response rate in 2013 was, therefore, about 1,200 responses. And so 45% of those respondents left a comment. That means that we have over 500 written comments of various lengths to deal with. Um, and this year, I anticipate we have a lower response rate, but we still have hundreds and hundreds of comments uh, that are available for us to analyze. And this is good, this is a great thing, um, but it means that we need a, a method to systematically cope with them. So for those of you who are familiar with LibQual, um, this logo is a little bit old, it might look familiar, and I'm just, I just gave you a snapshot of our um, old website, and um, we do have a history of sharing our LibQual results with our community, and this is from 2002, uh, when the librarian uh, in charge and the library staff supporting LibQual would uh, share the results notebook, um, share interpretation of the results, and also uh, provide details about what actions are being taken for, to improve services or to respond to the needs of users based on all of the results from LibQual. Um, so we have a, a strong track record for communicating this, and we continue to try um, to do that. Um, and I have here a snapshot of our McGill Tribune. This is a paper, um, the newspaper that is no longer in print, um, where we, we do try to um, share with our community um, what we're doing, what the results are, and what actions we're trying to take and follow up on. One of the benefits of running LibQual over more than a decade is the longitudinal trends that are available to us. Um, we can use that longitudinal information, and here I have a 10-year span to show you just as an example. Um, we can see changes um, in response to particular items. This is an item on, um, this is Library's Place, item two. So quiet space for individual activities and undergraduate students who um, place a high value on, on library space and quiet study space um, and their perceptions, and we can compare that to the ARL average as well over time. And we can see that over time we are getting closer to the average, which is something that um, we are always trying to do. And you'll see here, I think we also have it for graduate students. Um, we're a little bit, little bit better at uh, meeting their, um, their needs. Um, so that being said, um, that's the quantitative data and the results that we get back um, from the LibQual uh, reports. So in the past, we have a long history of thorough analysis by user group as well as by branch. McGill employed a data specialist who focused a large proportion of time conducting analysis and writing detailed reports based on um, the results notebook that we would receive from ARL. And these were used at the branch level, so each branch head would get a report, not just of the overall library, but also for their branch. They would be able to see the, the means, um, the scores, the LibQual scores, for each of the items for their particular groups of users who identify themselves as using that particular branch. Um, and they could use that to inform changes. And as well, at the system-wide level, the library could also look at larger trends and institute changes. Typically, comments were sorted by branch. And those comments were then divided up and shared with all staff, and in particular, the heads of branches. 
who could then go through the comments, read through, and also use those to inform decision making. There was also some topic analysis that was done to help decipher the results and scores and answer specific questions. Um, but for the most part, the analysis was a little more ad hoc. So for instance, we would load the data into qualitative software perhaps, but mostly we would just use it to search for particular terms. For example, if we needed more information about how people were reacting to a change in the catalog, we would search for the word catalog and look at the comments about the catalog. Um, so the, the way that we were analyzing the data was focusing much more on the quantitative than the qualitative. Um, and this word cloud is an example of a few years ago we tried to really think more about the qualitative data and started to try to display and present it to all of the staff in a way that was make it more interesting to them to dig deeper into it. Um, and at that time, as I mentioned, I started as the assessment librarian. I have a background in qualitative methods. And so I was interested in doing a little more in-depth qualitative analysis. And the opportunity arose in the spring of 2013, just as the LibQual survey was closing. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I see that someone can't hear. Molly uh, Greg had, uh, Okay, otherwise it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we did have the opportunity in the spring of 2013 to work with a student um, from the School of Information Studies. Um, McGill University has a project, a program for students, a volunteer program for students who want to do a practicum, also known as an internship. It's an unpaid um, internship for which students get course credit. They spend 120 hours over a semester. In this case, it was the spring semester, um, which worked out really well uh, with our with Paul. So uh, what we did was we found someone who had an interest in qualitative analysis, a little bit of background in research, and an interest in assessment. And um, a practicum student uh, joined the library for those three months. And the objective of that practicum project was to develop an analysis plan for the open-ended comments to actually run that analysis, at least for a portion of the comments, for the most recent LibQual survey, that is the 2013 survey, and at the end to create a toolkit so that this wouldn't just be a one-time occasion, but in fact we would develop a method that would hopefully be sustainable and that we could continue to use for every time we ran LibQual. Um, and so I'm pleased to say that it was successful, a very successful practicum. Um, the student, Jennifer Combois, is now a librarian at a college uh, here in Montreal. Um, but it was a very fruitful um, practicum or internship. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, it started off with some, the student did some readings and met with some librarians, including myself, to familiarize herself with library assessment in general, um, assessment in university settings. She read about LibQual and reviewed results notebooks from previous iterations of the survey at McGill and looked at coding practices that were published. And there are several publications, and I have some references for you at the end um, of some of the, of the ones that she found the most useful. In addition to that, um, we provided some training for her so that she could be familiar with qualitative coding methodology and, of course, the actual software to do the coding. Uh, the software in this case was atlas.ti. Uh, atlas is well-known qualitative software, and it's the one we use here at McGill Library. Um, and then um, the practicum student was involved in developing a code book, um, the, doing the actual coding and analysis for a, a significant portion of the comments that we received in 2013, and finally developing a, a toolkit which included a guide on how to conduct analysis uh, going forward. So I'll talk more about these uh, in a little bit more detail now. So first, um, I'll show you the, an example, a portion of the code book. Um, and so the method for analysis employed here is template analysis. And template analysis begins with a, a code list, which is essentially a, a list of codes and their definitions, in some cases examples. Um, and it, template analysis makes use of mostly deductive coding. That is where you have a code, you have a list of codes, and you try to apply the existing codes to the data that you're, an, you're reading and analyzing. But it also allows for inductive coding, that is the addition of new codes, splitting of codes into more than one code or category, and editing or removal of codes as we see fit. So the initial code list was developed um, from previous comments analysis at McGill and from also the code list that we had from other universities that have been published. So codes aren't mutually exclusive. So a segment of text can, or a segment of a comment can be coded with more than one code, and this is known as parallel coding. 
So in the end, this codebook had a total of 57 codes, um, and some of these were collapsed into larger categories. And with a few exceptions, these fell within the three dimensions measured by LibQual. So those are library as place, affective service, and information control. Um, the few exceptions to those uh, categories were a special category, special codes, um, comments on behalf of students. So this is the case where faculty would advocate for students. And that was a particular type of code that emerged, um, type of comment that emerged. And another set, for example, that were just comments about the LibQual survey administration itself. So there were a few extra codes, but for the most part they fell into the three broad dimensions. Um, so there were three iterations of the coding. Uh, the practicum student who managed to actually code about two-thirds of all the comments, um, and she actually coded the comments by faculty and graduate students. Um, the first round involved an initial coding and creation and refinement of new and existing codes. The second iteration allowed for a complete coding of the comments, and the final iteration of coding um, served as a review and confirmation of the coding process, and that also was a way to finalize the codebook. Um, and as I mentioned, these codes mostly aligned with the LibQual dimensions. So the codebook actually has sort of two parts to it. One is um, a hierarchical list, so the dimensions, in some cases subcategories, and then the actual list of codes by category. And um, the practicum student or anyone doing the coding can sort of print that up and have a nice look hierarchically to see all the categories and the codes, much like subject headings. So it's a quick overview. Um, after doing coding for a few hours, though, you start to memorize and you know what, what the codes are. Um, Another document was created which was just alphabetical with a list of all the codes and all the definitions and examples um, and exemplars to help with coding if, if, for example, the coder is not sure which code or codes to apply in a particular context. So once the codes are complete, um, using the software you can generate reports in Atlas by the code or by the user group or by combination of user group, for example, undergraduates, all the codes about noise, and pull those up. And reading through those um, code by code, one could then um, develop, uh, do further analysis, interpretation, and write up the report. And so a draft of that was started by the student, and, but the full report uh, from the comment analysis was created by um, the assessment librarian, who was me. And the findings were organized by the dimension and then subcategory and by code. So for example, there would be a a set of findings or a summary of the comments analysis on the library website, on database, and on noise. And if there were differences between user groups or notable differences, these would be remarked on in these sections. Um, and in some cases, direct quotes were included to provide evidence as to the findings. So these summary of the findings were shared with all employees along with the original cleaned comments. So those are the 500 plus comments, but the findings was a much um, shorter document and it was a tighter summary. Um, after that, uh, the Library Assessment Advisory Committee, of which uh, the, library, the assessment librarian is chair, they used that findings document to develop recommendations, and in total for 2013 there were eight recommendations uh, that emerged from those findings, and these were presented to the library leadership, and in 2014 during a strategic planning exercise, those recommendations were incorporated in different ways into strategic intentions um, that were uh, part of the library's, um, well, part of their exercise and, and part of a larger um, exercise that included all staff's input. So as part of that, outcomes and targets were identified in order to address the recommendations. And those recommendations came directly from the analysis of the comments from LibQual. So we continue to, at McGill Library, share the results of LibQual survey. We continue to try to share um, the service improvements and changes that we've made. Um, for 2013, we're still in the process of making uh, improvements, um, uh, but we continue to try to communicate with our community about that. And finally, I just want to mention the toolkit. So the, pro the practicum project had as its goal to develop a method that was sustainable and that we could continue to use here at McGill University. Um, and so what it consisted of, this toolkit, was a guide, a uh, step-by-step guide for those conducting analysis of open-ended comments in LibQual. It includes recommended readings, um, including additional readings uh, to prepare someone for the process, depending on their familiarity with qualitative analysis, um, coding, LibQual. It includes step-by-step -step instructions for loading the comments into the software 
um, the automatic coding that happens for demographics, as well as the steps for actually conducting the coding itself, the code book, um, the guide for applying the codes, and um, how to create reports in the software, as well as an appendix uh, well, with the code book and the definitions. So this guide, the toolkit itself, um, it's about 20 pages. It is specific to McGill, but I believe it's transferable to other contexts. Um, it also includes information about the number of hours needed for coding, um, and it's estimated for the number of comments. Um, it also includes information about the number of hours needed for training, um, and that's divided up by training, learning the software, familiarization with the code book. So the idea is that in any given year that we run the LibQual survey, we have enough information to decide um, if one person is to undertake the coding, if that person is completely new to qualitative analysis and to the software, um, if we know the number of comments, we can estimate how much time, how many hours are actually required to conduct the coding um, and finish the analysis, um, as opposed to somebody who may already be familiar with qualitative analysis and the software, um, how many hours that would take. And so the idea is that no matter who is responsible for LibQual, that that information is available and somebody can undertake qualitative analysis of the open-ended comments and make use of them. So this is not a, a solo activity. I just want to acknowledge um, the huge effort made by the um, practicum student in 2013, Jennifer Kambwa, and the advisory committee to assessment, which um, was instrumental in getting the findings in, into actionable recommendations for the library. And as promised, here are some references to articles about specifically about how to conduct analysis um, of open-ended comments. I know there are more than this, but I just wanted to give a few uh, that we found particularly inspiring. Yeah, I have another slide. <laughs> Martha has another slide. So thanks very much. I also, if you are interested, we have more information about LibQual at McGill on our, on our assessment website. Lori, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, the number of hours. What oh. are some of the specific <laughs> breakdowns? Um, you know, I don't have that information in front of me. I forgot it. Um, that's a good point. Um, the practicum student estimated that it takes a full 30 hours of training for somebody who's brand new to um, the software, um, qualitative analysis software. In this case, it's Atlas um, or Atlas.ti, depending on how you want to say it. Um, and in order to learn about coding, so that's reading a few articles um, or a chapter about how to do qualitative coding, and and perhaps speaking, you know, speaking with the assessment librarian or learning um, about qualitative analysis and deductive and inductive coding, what's mm -hmm. generally known as template analysis. Um, and then mm -hmm. the actual coding depends on the number of comments. Obviously, comments vary in length, um, but uh, I think if, I, if memory serves, it's about another 50 hours for about 500 comments. Mm -hmm. this is, yeah, no, this is a, a good ballpark. Um, and uh, we have offered at ARL training on Atlas TI over it in the past, uh, typically over a two and a half day training. Um, uh, so, you know, 30 hours, yeah, and then. You know, of course, you have to practice like everything. Um, thing, everything um, with analysis. The more you do, the more of an expert you become. The more insights you gain into um, the different aspects of um, of this methodology. And I would recommend that people go and read your full uh, toolkit uh, information. Yeah. I did say that I have some more references, mm -hmm. um, and here are some additional references. Um, it's it's interesting to to note that you know the qualitative uh, analysis is a fundamental uh, approach of the LibQual protocol uh, because the original items were developed and standardized based on extensive interviews uh, that were uh, coded um, with Atlas TI and. Um, uh, through an iterative approach uh, reduced into questions that then were tested to see whether they were valid and reliable from a quantitative perspective. And then that, that was an iterative approach over the first three years of the development of the protocol. And there is Colin Cook's dissertation uh, that captures uh, the mixed methods mm -hmm. approach. 
But beyond that, um, the Goodry article here, the 2002 article, uh, took feedback on the actual instrument and um, analyzed that feedback, uh, and um, there was refinement on the instrument based on that feedback. Then uh, we started seeing gradually, you know, more people approaching those comments in a more systematic way. Um, you can see the 2004 article uh, from um, uh, Begay and other co-authors there, um, and uh, 2009, uh, Margaret uh, Friesen, uh, who's at UBC in Canada, University of British Columbia, uh, did an analysis. Um, in uh, 2008, uh, uh, Jones and Kayongo from the University of Notre Dame uh, published uh, a piece in college and research libraries. Uh, the uh, 2011 article by Greenwald and uh, co-authors uh, captures the University of Mississippi analysis of the qualitative and the quantitative. And the most recent work, um, it, uh, it's actually officially not published, but it is actually accessible as a pre-publication, uh, as a preprint through the uh, college and research libraries website. Um, the, it's, the official publication date is going to be September 1, 2015. I have put the URL there, uh, a piece by uh, Detlor and Ball from Mac, uh, Mac, uh, McMaster University. Uh, they, have, they have also approached the comments uh, in a very interesting way. So the, our understanding of how we approach uh, this kind of information is evolving. Um, and um, uh, actually, I would be very interested in seeing whether um, your effort, your toolkit, will be adopted by others. I know there was uh, an effort to by uh, Brown University and Dan O'Mahony um, and others um, that have presented at the Library Assessment Conference where they try to standardize a code book, so I often refer people to that effort. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. So Charlie Goss is asking, do you always conduct one wholesale analysis of all responses, or do you ever split results by user group and then analyze each set separately? Um, if I understand that question correctly, um, it's a good question because in the past, um, the, the way before we cr we developed this method, um, it, there was well there was no strict method, but they were typically actually divided by branch, because as you know in LibQual, um, the respondent can select which branch they use the most, um, the most frequently, and so we would divide them up that way. That is not how we did it this time, the, the 2013. We did actually divide it by large the large set of user group in terms of undergraduate graduate faculty, and then all the staff and other groups in different categories. Um, and that was partly done because the practicum student was not, was only, a, because she had a restricted number of hours, we decided to limit, um, first she started with faculty and then went on to graduate students when she realized how much comment analysis she could get done. Um, and so. I think that's how we would do it going forward, and that also allows us to identify differences at least between these types of user groups. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, though. We don't break it down, for instance, by sex or by age group or other types of groups, but by those user groups we do. By the basic ones, yeah. The basic ones. And there's yeah. another question by Sherry Andrews, whether you engage in, in member checking. Um, yeah. I saw that question. Um, well, no, we can't because it is they are um, anonymous, they are anonymized. However, um, in the future what we do plan on doing is having, from the findings, some questions may arise and we are hoping to conduct focus groups um, with a, a new advisory group to the library so that we can follow up on questions that arise from the comments just to make sure our assumptions are correct. So those wouldn't be necessarily with people who responded to LibQual, um, but it would be a way of going back to our users to verify our findings. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah. Paul is asking, what is the process of to clean the comments? Um, 
the Wait, weather. Uh, you, mm -hmm. I can answer that if you'd like, mm -hmm. at McGill. Um, it's very, it, when we say clean, it's very simple. Um, the raw comments that are provided uh, by ARL, to, which are provided immediately when the survey closes, I believe, in an Excel spreadsheet, all we do to clean those is that means that one or two people read over the comments and remove any identifying information, either of the user who's responded so that they remain anonymous, and also of library staff, any library personnel who might be able to be identified. Um, and that's just to, well, to protect um, their privacy. And, and in some cases, some comments are removed if they are extremely egregious. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, cleaning just means removing identifiable information. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I think a, an item we were chatting about it before uh, is a longitudinal analysis of the comments a good approach? I th I, that's a question that we are starting to ask. Um, in fact, Martha and I were just chatting about this earlier. We do have um, 10 different sets of comments now at McGill spanning over a decade, well, spanning uh, 15 years. Um, there's a lot of qualitative data, and it, it would be interesting um, to look at the data set as a whole, um, to look at differences in themes or codes that emerge over time, and how you know um, things have changed. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But I think that also um, points to the reason why it's good to have a consistent, rigorous method for qualitative analysis um, that is implemented um, in order to be able in the long term to make comparisons more efficiently and effectively. Um, so right now what that would mean would be going back to the earlier data and implementing the current method that we designed in 2013. Yeah. I think the other advantage of, of doing analysis with the comments and telling people what analysis you do and showing how you are improving is that it will help I think with uh, marketing the survey next time around, especially if there is a question about ideas to get higher response <laughs> rates, part of the communication could include um, elements of, you know, this is how we improved, you know, these are the two, three key improvements we did last year based on, you know, mm -hmm. your feedback help us, guide us for next year's improvements or something like that. Uh, Certainly, McKenzie. and we've done that in the past, and I think that is a very effective way to improve the response rate. Yeah. The, the back to the cleaning of the data, uh, Emily Thornton was uh, mm -hmm. uh, inquiring whether when you remove identifiable information, it's um, in relation only to negative um, comments, or do you do that when the comment is positive, too? Um, that's a good question. Um, we d I do remove all of the names or identifying information mm -hmm. from all comments, whether they're positive or negative or neutral. Um, there's a lot of focus on positive and negative when people talk about um, the comments, and I, I find that to be very black and white. Sometimes it's a little more nuanced. And so it's, I feel that it would be biased to only remove identifying information if the comments are negative. But what I do do is when a comment is positive is I do share it with that staff member. So if someone is named, I will copy it and let them know someone said something nice about you, for instance, and share it with them. But in the comments as a whole, that document is shared with all library staff. Mm -hmm. And so for certain people who have a lot of uh, public facing, they work a lot with the public, they may be mentioned several times. Um, and so we, I just, we just remove, we remove all the names so that there is no sort of preferential yeah. Uh, bias, I've, and there's no negative bias towards people. So we remove names, but we do not remove the comment. And I will sometimes remove information if it identifies the person. For instance, um, the individual uh, with brown hair um, mm -hmm. who works at this particular branch on Saturdays, I will remove yeah. that information so that nobody can be identified. Yeah, makes good sense. Um, and uh, one last question before we close. Has McGill adopted the Live Call Light protocol? So I just keep referring it to LibQual, but of course it's LibQual Lite. We've been using LibQual Lite um, for the past few iterations. And in fact, in this year, we used 100% LibQual Lite. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Lori. Um, thank you to everybody who's been attending. 
and uh, you will get the slides and a link to the uh, webcast, uh, the recorded webcast on the ARL YouTube channel. Stay in touch with us. Thank Bye. you.